You're listening to Skills World Live with Tom Buick. News, views, and interviews in association with FE News. Good evening, everyone. The sunshine is back. At least it was in my neck of the woods today. Whether you got to do a spot of furlough-induced gardening today or you finally mastered the mute button on GoToWebinar, it's time, ladies and gentlemen, to kick back and relax. And let me, Tom Buick, your FE Community Radio DJ, bring you an uplifting vibe of musical and topical debate on the only radio show dedicated to skills, apprenticeships and, of course... FE. That's right, folks. As I was reminded by an inspirational tweet I read earlier today, challenges are what make life interesting, and overcoming them is what makes life meaningful, it said. So let the Skills World Live team serve you up another bumper crop of meaningful discussion and debate as we all face the coronavirus challenge together. It's a big milestone on Skills World Live this evening. As we reach the dizzy heights of 10 full episodes, all now available in glorious playback at your favourite podcasting sites and at fenews.co.uk. To think, Kelly O'Mara, the show's editor, known across the media industry for her high and exacting standards, hasn't even issued me yet with my radio DJ, P45. Coming up on tonight's show, we'll be focusing on the disadvantage and attainment gap in education. I'll be talking to a leading politician, Leila Moran, a former maths and physics teacher, no less, about the disadvantage gap. And other sector experts too, from the world of education and skills, including a former education minister, who have deep insights and analysis of how, as a country, we are supporting, or perhaps not supporting, some of our most vulnerable learners. But first, let's find out what's making the news headlines in the world of FE this evening. The quango that inspects schools and colleges in England, Ofsted, has started publishing reports again. Four new reports based on pre-COVID-19 visits appeared on the Quality Watchdog's website yesterday, including two good full inspections and two early monitoring visit reports on apprenticeship providers. Ofsted had paused the publication of all further education and skills reports, apart from social care inspections, in late March, because of the strict social distancing measures preventing inspectors from visiting schools and post-16 providers. In other news, the Association of Colleges 2020 COVID-19 survey has revealed that colleges stand to lose £150 million by the next academic year due to the pandemic. With over £2 billion of college income uncertain for next academic year, colleges are worried that they will lack the resources and the capacity to support the increase in students they are expecting. And finally... Coventry University has announced that it will be providing free accommodation to care leavers. The new scheme will initially support 10 undergraduates who have left care and require accommodation for 52 weeks per year. The Midlands-based university told this programme that supporting care leavers was a key part of its drive to help more students benefit from higher education who come from underrepresented groups. That's all your Skills World News from fenews.co. UK. Contact us at Skills World Live. Email skillsworld at fenews.go.uk. Follow us on Twitter at Tom Buick at FE News. Use the hashtag Skills World. Call us on 02032 900 treble one. That's 02032 900 treble one. Sometimes it really feels like I lose control. On 
That's Find Myself. Regular artists on this show. That's Klinger. What three RS? Tonight's big debate is on the theme of how will COVID-19 widen the disadvantage and attainment gap for students? Anyone informed about educational attainment, of course, will tell you that a pretty large gap already existed for many individuals and communities well before the current crisis. In Britain... The attainment gap starts before kids even enrol in primary school. On average, a child from a deprived background is up to 16 months behind their wealthier peers. And this gap continues growing right up until adulthood. One positive piece of news is that a number of independent research studies have found in recent years that the attainment gap has been closing. The less good news is that the gap has been closing only very very slowly. For example, a major study a couple of years ago by the Education Policy Institute found that despite significant investment and targeted intervention programmes by all governments of different political persuasions, the gap between disadvantaged 16-year-old pupils and their peers has only narrowed by three months of learning between 2007 and 2016. In 2016, the gap nationally at the end of secondary school was still 19.3 months. In fact, disadvantaged pupils fall behind their more affluent peers by around two months each year over the course of secondary school. Over the same period, that's 2007 to 2016, the gap by the end of primary school narrowed by 2.8 months and the gap by age 5 narrowed by 1.2 months. At current trends, however, educational experts estimate that it would take around 50 years, that's right, 50 years for the disadvantaged gap to close completely by the time pupils take their GCSEs. For pupils who are persistently disadvantaged, 
And by that, we mean those that have been eligible for free school meals for 80% or longer of their school lives. The gap at the end of secondary school has widened slightly since 2007 by three months. In 2016, it stood at 24.3 months. That's equivalent to over two years of learning that more deprived students are behind their wealthier peers. Of course, all these patterns of disadvantage can change markedly depending on what part of the country students grow up in and what social class or ethnic group they or their parents came from. But one thing is clear. Disadvantage and attainment gaps are already quite significant now. But what on earth will they be looking like when we work through the challenges associated with this pandemic? Coming up after this short musical break, I'll be talking to the Lib Dem spokesperson for education. She used to be one of those highly prized maths and physics teachers. And I'll be asking her what she thinks the government should be doing differently to close the attainment and disadvantage gaps. Stay tuned, folks. Leila Moran is coming up next. You're listening to Skills World Live with Tom Buick. That's the instrumental version there of Wholehearted by Daxton. Now, to kick off tonight's big debate, I'm joined on the line by the Member of Parliament for Oxford West and Abingdon. And she's also the Liberal Democrat spokesperson on education, Leila Moran. Good evening, Leila. Good evening. How are you? I'm very well, thanks. Yeah, it's sunny in this part of Sussex where I am. Yes, what about where you is. are? 
I'm in Oxford and it's a beautiful day. And uh, uh, one of the good things about lockdown is I've got more time to spend with my garden. And so I've laid some new turf and I feel like I'm constantly watering it to try and make it not die. But it's Great. a beautiful day and it's a delight to be here. Thank well, you for having me. Well, thank you on such a beautiful day for uh, you know, uh, agreeing to spare your time to talk to me on Skills World Live this evening. Now, uh, Leila, can I start with uh, quite a topical subject? Uh, the National Education Union and Parent Kind wrote to the Secretary of State, Gavin Williamson, today, calling on schools not to reopen until it is safe to do so. Where do you sit on this issue? I absolutely agree with them um, that we need to be sure that the safety of, well, there's, there's, there's actually three uh, facets to this right now, right? So on the one hand, schools are closed because it is safer for everyone else. We're trying to uh, push down the curve and make sure that we don't overwhelm the NHS. And to that end, I was very supportive of schools closing. Sure. Um, but there's another issue here, which is the safety of the staff who are in schools. And we still don't know the science behind transmission in children. Um, it's It's not clear. And so if schools are going to reopen, my view is that they should open when it's safe. We need to be clear that this, the science is pointing us in that direction, but also that each individual school has had a risk assessment done to it um, to decide at to what level it should open. And I think a blanket approach right now would be quite dangerous. So there will be schools in urban areas, in particular smaller footprints, that it's impossible because of the size of the corridors, for example, higgledy piggledy rooms, the layout of the school, that they can uh, do safe social distancing if that's what's needed. Um, if uh, the government's then going to insist that those kinds of schools open, I think there should absolutely be provision for protective equipment and so forth. But actually, in my view, we need to take a case by case approach. And those schools that can open should but those that can't, we need to mitigate against those risks. But then there's the third type, which I think speaks to some of what we're going to talk about tonight, which is the safety of the children who aren't at school. Uh, one of the most alarming uh, statistics that uh, we've been hearing is the proportion of vulnerable children uh, who they're defining as a, a child with a social care worker yeah. or who has an EHC plan who are in school. Now, that's at one point, it was as low as one or two percent. It went up to five. And then last uh, I heard, the 24th of April, the uh, figure was around 10 percent. Uh, and I wanted reassurance from the government about the other 90 percent. Now, whilst it's true that there are many, particularly those of the HC plans, where it's just better for them to be at home, yeah. um, for many of these kids, uh, that it's not frankly yeah and I mean, it's it is, troubled families and we need to ma sure. make sure we have eyes on them yeah i mean it is quite a dilemma isn't it i'm not i'm a parent of two primary school kids and one secondary school kid and you know the, I, obviously i'm trying to do my best with my partner in terms of the homeschooling arrangements but there will be parents mm. out there who will be listening to this who you know themselves may be tying down sometimes one job two, you know uh, two jobs in a family if indeed they'll still have jobs to go back to uh, at the end of all this i mean you know a lot of pressure is building up in the system isn't there just to sort of get mm. things reopened again and as you say there and we will come on to this about disadvantaged kids i mean the one thing that obviously vulnerable kids do have when they get a state education is effectively they've got a corporate parent making sure that they're safe and well. I mean, to what extent can you execute that corporate parenting role when they're in lockdown with parents? Yeah, well, in my view, actually, I think there is much more that the government could do and could have done. Um, and they have done some stuff. And I'm not I'm not here to government bash. And that's not yeah. the approach I've taken at all as an opposition MP. Actually, I think what people want to hear is we're working together and we're working constructively. And, and where that has been the case, I do that. But um, uh, Tom, I don't know if you know, but I was a teacher for 12 years yes, before I, did, I was an MP. You mentioned that on the show. You and, were a maths and physics uh, teacher, no less. <laughs> absolutely right. And safeguarding was drummed into me. And the first rule of safeguarding is you never assume until you are assured that someone is safe. And I'm concerned that the government hasn't done enough. And so what I've been calling for is a task force that can support schools and support local authorities to go and do the legwork, go and do the home visits, even if it's through the window, and you can have sight of these children. Um, and what I'm concerned about is that the government keep reassuring me, oh, they're fine. You know, children's services say they're fine. Yet they're saying they're fine. 
And on the other hand, what we knew is that last week they relaxed some of the safeguards that they had put in place because of, quote, pressures in the system, unquote. The two can't be true at the same time. And so I am genuinely concerned about the welfare of those kids. And by the way, those are the ones we know about. The other ones I'm really worried about, the ones we don't know about. Indeed. What I do know is that local authorities are preparing for a huge spike in kids who are going to be referred uh, to children's social care. Um, and I'm pleased that the government has given the NSPCC a huge amount of money mm. in order to advertise to kids. But I've also been calling for social influences on places like YouTube. You know, yeah. the ones that our kids are on their headphones watching someone play Minecraft. And you're like, what are you doing? <laughs> Let's face it. This is the one place in the house where it's least likely that yeah. if there is a problematic relationship that that parent's going to be in or that care is going to be in. And it might be the one place that the child might get the information. And I genuinely think that there is more that the government could have sure. done. And I'm really worried about this. Yeah. No, I'm, I, I appreciate you were not in Parliament during the coalition government years. Um, but is there anything you think that should have been done differently in terms of education policy? I mean, where did you sit, for example, on tuition fees? Yeah. So first of all, no, I wasn't. Uh, and actually, I was a very uncomfortable Lib Dem during that time, as I'm sure many voters were. Um, uh, I joined the party, though, because it had very good education policy. And I was doing a, a master's, actually, in comparative education at the IOE mm. and uh, cool headedly compared where all the parties were on education and the Lib Dems were closest. Um, the stuff that we did end up pushing through uh, that was our idea to push through were things like the pupil premium. Yeah. Uh, which I think were hugely advantageous. And on things like tuition fees, the problem with that policy uh, was that we said we'd do one thing and then did something else and lost the trust of the electorate. And it was absolutely yeah. critical uh, for our party. And we were roundly punished for it, and rightly so. Um, but the other thing that I think actually, which almost has deeper implications, is, is the demise of things like youth services and local authority funding. Now, that was some of the last stuff that ended up going. And actually, if you look at the way those budgets were managed, it was actually post-2015, so after right. coalition had ended, that most of those cuts were made. But looking at where we are now, what will have had the greatest effect? Actually, those services are the ones that I think should have been better supported for a much longer period of time. Okay. And that's successive governments that that's happened under. And it's not good enough. You know, these mm -hmm. are some of the most vulnerable children in our society. And so at the last election, I tried to make as, as much a fuss as I could about this area. Of course, it was really difficult with Brexit going on. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, you wouldn't want to start from here, I think, is where a lot of people feel about sure. different services. Yeah. Now, tonight's show, we're looking at the attainment gap. Um, research shows that since 2009, it has been closing only slightly for primary school and secondary school pupils uh, in England. Uh, and in fact, I'll, I'll be talking to uh, David Laws, you know, your former colleague uh, later on the show. I mean, he was school standards minister and introduced, mm -hmm. for example, the pupil premium. But what measures would you like to see the government now put in place to really sort of speed up the progress of closing the attainment gap? Well, first of all, Tom, I think there's two things here. One, it has been there for a long time. It's been flatlining sure. yeah, in the yeah. last couple of years. And uh, if we had started before COVID-19, then there would have been a huge push that was needed. Uh, in my view, uh, the, the uh, curriculum in particular has become a bit backward facing. There's a lot that we should and could be doing if you look at uh, other countries uh, across the world. But actually, if you just look at the educational research, which is my background, about what yeah. works to close these gaps, what you want is a more child-centred curriculum. Uh, you want one that is sort of engaging them in their imagination, creativity and thought. You don't have this uh, odd divide between skills and content, uh, that data-driven approach that we see from Ofsted uh, and the Department for Education through things like league tables and SATs. I wouldn't uh, have. And uh, in our most recent policy in the last election, I called for SATs to be scrapped and also Ofsted to be completely replaced and the abol abolition of league tables. You know, these are the kinds of things yeah. that we need to do to really engage all children to make the most of their education. Um, but during COVID-19, it's got even worse because what I've been hearing in Oxford West and Abingdon is we've got kids here who just don't have access to the internet. Yeah. And it's not about broadband speed necessarily. Maybe yeah. their houses do have broadband, broadband, but they don't have the money to buy a laptop or an iPad. 
And so literally my office has been sourcing iPads and laptops for kids locally. Now there's something wrong with this because if you think, you know, UN Charter for the Rights of the Child says that education is a right, it's a human right. Mm -hmm. And if the only way that these days you can access education is by going online, and there are children that cannot go online, by definition, we are therefore stopping kids from accessing education so, as the and government not scheme, fulfilling their human rights. Yeah, I mean, just on that it's point, not enough. Yeah, because I mean, I think this whole issue of the digital divide was already there pre-COVID-19, but it's it's been brought into sharp focus, obviously, because a lot of meetings, a lot of education now has had to move online. But as the department scheme then uh, it announced, which was about getting laptops to mm -hmm. more deprived pupils, are you saying that that's, in your constituency, it's just, it's just not working by the sounds of it? Well, it was being focused on the older groups. Right. Um, so for the younger ones, it wasn't in place. And there's a real focus on year 10, which is right. But it needs to be much bigger, in my view. And the schools know. I mean, yeah. those people who are listening to this, who are teachers and head teachers, will know who the kids are in those families who maybe and maybe they're preschool meals, but they don't have a social worker because the definition of disadvantaged seems to be linked to those. Mm -hmm. But maybe they're just on the edge. Maybe they were a family that, you know, yeah. school had had an eye on for some time, but hadn't quite got to the point of making that referral. Um, Actually, in my view, it should be a much bigger scheme. And it, the teachers, you should just trust them to know their yeah. kids because nine times out of ten, they do. They absolutely do. Sure. I've just got time to ask you, Leila, about further education. That's obviously um, within your brief as well. What's mm -hmm. the uh, Lib Dem sort of policy position on, for example, implementation of the Alga review? Alga review. I mean, it seems like... Um, mm such a long time ago now that reported yeah. but it, uh, it was a very important report looking at post-16 education and skills training I mean would you for example support some kind of rebalancing of resources from universities to our further education colleges I absolutely well I don't know if it's necessarily rebalancing right. I would take the two separately because I was quite critical of some of the suggestions it was making around tuition fees but actually I thought some of the stuff it was talking about in terms of valuing FE and properly paying for a blossoming FE sector is really important. And I've been supporting, you know, calls for FE colleges to be paid the same as schools per pupil and for pay rises for those who work in FE colleges. They do an incredible job. And very often with some quite, you know, kids who don't fit into the system, which you just heard me criticise, I think actually the system itself needs changing top to bottom. Um, but the value of what FE colleges do is so amazing um, and could well be the answer to when we come out of COVID. If we think ahead, you know, to the next year or so, uh, Rishi Sunak said uh, this week that he's thinking of winding down furlough. If he does that, then we are looking at mass changes to the economy. Yeah. We're looking at masses of retraining. We're looking at young people taking their first steps on the job market when the rungs of the ladder are being pulled out before they've even begun. And when you look at the research about what effect that has on their life chances moving forward in the same way in that cohort in 2008, 2009, they never really recover fully. You know, we've got this problem, but also this opportunity where FE colleges could fill in the gap of the mass retraining that we may well need at the end of COVID. So actually I'm totally behind FE colleges uh, and lifelong learning in general being given much greater prominence. It sounds uh, from what you're saying that you'd also probably support the Association of Colleges call today for what they're calling the September Guarantee, which is effectively to ensure that all young people, whatever situation they find themselves in as a result of COVID-19, are actually guaranteed a place at our FE colleges. Absolutely. Absolutely. And more than that, I mean, there is there is also a huge opportunity to, to increase not just the places that have been offered, but places in general. I mean, I really think yeah. the government has not taken a moment to take its head out of the sand because it's firefighting. And actually, I'm not going to be uh, I'm not going to be trite about this. I, to be a minister at a time of this level of worldwide sure. crisis must be very difficult. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, uh, if they don't start looking to that medium and long term horizon now, then they won't have time to put things that are robust in place. A good example of, of where, you know, going too fast has been particularly bad for disadvantaged kids is the changes that have been made to the end of year assessments for not just apprenticeships, but also A-levels. You know, we are worried across the board that disadvantaged kids are going to get 
disproportionately affected by those end of year judgments that come from, you know, mocks uh, to the fact that you know, the, those assessments that you would do in class. Uh, Sutton Trust has looked at this very closely, but this has been well documented in research for a long time now. Uh, that that expectation on those children pushes them down and it should be the other way around. We should t- use this opportunity and, and avoid the mistakes of the 80s where when you saw the industries were folding, mm-hmm. There was nothing put in their place. Let's do the opposite. Well, alas, there's not time to go back to the 80s on this show. But, uh, Lena Moran, (laughs) I really appreciate uh, you taking the time this evening. Thank you so much for joining us from your constituency. Thank you. Pleasure. You're listening to Skills World Live with Tom Buick. Emily 
from Epidemic Sound. So to continue the debate, I had hoped to be speaking to the former Education Minister, David Laws. Tried his landline several times, but alas, he wasn't picking up. But have no fear, we still have on the line Carol Willis, who's the Chief Executive of the National Foundation for Educational Research, and Issa Mutlib, who's the Chief Executive Officer of the BAME Apprenticeship Alliance. Welcome both to the show. Hi, Tom. Thank you for having us on. I'm sure we'll do our best to make up for the absence of David Laws. <laughs> um, Good well, you know what? I always like talking to people who are at the front line and delivering and have done a lot of... Uh, mind you, to be fair, David's done a huge amount of research, uh, not least as chair of the Education Policy Institute. Perhaps we'll get him on a future show. Now, Carol, you're an economist by background, and previously to your role running the National Foundation for Educational Research, you were... A, the Chief Analyst and Scientific Advisor at the Department for Education. To what extent do you see you know, some of the challenges we're discussing uh, this evening about the attainment and disadvantage gap about uh, um, really an issue for education or is it more really about economic prospects that uh, if they were better would perhaps tackle the attainment and disadvantage gap? What's your perspective well, that, on that? That's a really good question, Tom, and something I wanted to pick up. There's a whole set of issues around COVID-19 and the extent to which it will widen the gap for disadvantaged students. But there's three key things, three key reasons why disadvantaged children are likely to um, suffer more than other children in this crisis. One is the lack of access to technology um, that Leila mentioned. The second is that they're more likely to live in crowded conditions, making it very difficult to find a quiet place to study. And the third is that their parents may be less able, uh, have less confidence in being able to support their learning. Um, And there may be other financial worries as well, which are are, are impacting on the situation. And those are part of a wider set of social issues. Uh, And I think education needs to be more effectively joined up with other um, government departments, looking at other areas of social policy to try and address some of these wider challenges in the uh, in the longer term. Sure. Well, I mean, we'll drill down to perhaps some of those issues shortly. But um, turning to you, Issa, I mean, you run the uh, BAME Apprenticeship uh, Alliance. In education, actually, when you look at uh, attainment of uh, ethnic minority groups, not all, but um, you know, some do relatively well, actually, you know, particularly compared, for example, to white working class boys. But is that a pattern of disadvantage for BAME groups uh, accessing apprenticeships? Is is that better or worse than the, the general population? So if we're... Uh, firstly, uh, good evening to everybody. Um, good evening. I, I think you, the, there's a two ways of looking at this. So one way of looking at this is from a, a general um, BAME representation uh, within the labour workforce. And and the impact that COVID could have on that. And then there's one which is specific to uh, apprenticeships. From an apprenticeship perspective, uh, what we have seen is a rise in uh, BAME um, individuals accessing apprenticeships. And uh, whether that's attributed to the efforts that have been put in from the government or local communities and so on and so forth, um, likely could be. But what we have seen is that increase. And... Uh, whereas with um, further education, it's always been there. The appetite has always been there. And this has been a, a historic thing, that, that the appetite for further education has been there. Uh, and with apprenticeships being an alternative and now being more visible as a route to take, uh, an, an, an accredible alternative route to take, uh, it has been on the rise. But you know, uh, Issa, that um, in terms of apprenticeship, development over the last few years it's tended to favor uh older uh, learners and uh, not those below the age of um, 25 it's tended to be for sort of high level management skills for example yeah i, I, I mean again um because i'm sure you've looked at some of the data on this i mean is there anything about that drift if you like towards the higher levels and um you know the levy funding being used for mbas and the like uh, any of that concern you so the, the concern is that um, those uh, young uh, people leaving uh, college, uh, as schools and college now, uh, uh, they will enter the workforce or the, the labour market with uh, lack of skills, effectively, that they can 
take forward to progress further in their lives. So if you look at some of the uh, economic factors, the factors are which leads to individuals becoming uh, high risk, risks of, as needs, uh, as in not in education training. And echoing some of the points Carol made, which was about the lack of uh, access to uh, technology, the uh, crowded conditions, and the, especially the parental confidence in the learning that's coming ahead. Um, this is where there could potentially be an issue uh, where you're missing out on uh, the focus of 16 to 18 year olds. So if you look at, um, uh, you know, if you look post um, uh, post recession 2008 and 9 sure. the unemployment was high within school leavers and it was yes. mo- most the highest in school leavers and apprenticeships helped essentially bring that down mm-hmm. significantly that's right. and then with the, with the levy coming in uh, that's not to say that it's not uh, helped young people i think the f- when we when we're talking the 16 to 18 year olds the focus has been lost yeah, and okay. it has been missing. Sure. All right. Well, let's move back to Carol now, because, um, uh, Carol, uh, your foundation has done a huge amount of uh, research on the attainment disadvantage gap. But could you just try and um, summarise for listeners? And, you know, I don't want to sort of dumb down the debate in the sense of saying, you know, just give us those two or three quick fixes that could get us uh, all back on track and or indeed accelerate closing the attainment disadvantage gap. But from your experience and your research, what are the kind of um, interventions, you know, what are the things actually that governments could do both now and, and indeed with some of the challenges we're going to face with COVID-19? Yeah, we, we have done various pieces of work around the gap and how best to narrow it. We did a big piece of work a few years ago looking at the pupil premium and uh, which schools were narrowing the gap um, more quickly than others and what they were actually doing. Because it's not just about the government, it's about what schools themselves can do. And we found there were a number of measures there and we produced a set of guidance for schools around uh, putting the best teachers with the pupils who are struggling the most, uh, making effective use of data to identify children's learning uh, gaps, uh, uh, tackling the issue in earlier years, so not just putting uh, the effort in at the end of a key stage and there might be a particularly important assessment or exam coming up, but but, but starting earlier, uh, and using personalised approaches. And I think the other crucial thing is the the development and work that the Education Endowment Foundation has been doing over the last uh, five to ten years, uh, working very closely with NFER and other research organisations mm-hmm. to understand the, the kind of interventions that are most effective yeah. uh, in improving outcomes for disadvantaged children. So I think research has a key role to play there in identifying you know, what works best and things like um, feedback to pupils is critically important and not very uh, expensive. Yes. Uh, things like one-to-one tuition and small group tuition are more effective than summer schools. So in terms of thinking about what kind of interventions we might put in place to enable children to catch up, um, it's those kinds of evidence-based uh, approaches that we need to, to look at and think about the overall costs and benefits of of how to get us back on track. Yeah. I mean, looking at the pupil premium, and I mean, I had some interaction with this when I was uh, chair of a local education authority for two years and had lots of conversations with head teachers, you know, about their pupil premium. It's obviously something that Ofsted has looked at when it goes into schools. The thing that always sort of slightly uh, confused me was this, the fact that although obviously the money is attached to the individual, uh, you know, how many individuals you have within your school that are eligible for pupil premium, it's still kind of absorbed, isn't it, within the school budget? And I'm not saying for a minute the head teachers then don't spend an, uh, that money wisely and invest it in uh, those uh, so-called pupil premium pupils, but it, it it does depend, doesn't it, very much on you know, on the leadership, on the teaching, on the governors and what they do with that money. Yeah, it does. And I actually worked with David Laws uh, at the Department for Education and we had a number of discussions um, around this. Right. So there's there's a couple of things. First of all, you're, you're right, the pupil premium goes into schools' budgets. It's not ring fenced uh, in the sense that schools can use it um, for whatever they want to do, whatever they think is most appropriate. And that's partly because some of the measures that they might want to put in place are whole class or whole school measures that have an impact for everyone and perhaps have a greater impact for those disadvantaged students. So the 
uh, the view was taken that it was it, it was better to leave schools to make those crucial decisions. Um, they're better placed to know well, a who are the pupils who need the most support and and how to how to implement it. It has we found in our research had a a really important role in helping schools to focus on disadvantaged yeah. pupils and to really pay more attention to their learning and development. So as a signalling device, uh, it's been very powerful. And of course, schools are required to set out on their website what their plan is, how they're using the pupil premium. And that's something uh, that Hofstede look at when they uh, when they go into schools. Okay. Issa, last word uh, for you, because uh, we're running out of time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, in, in terms of if there was one thing, and I appreciate there aren't magic bullets here, but if there was one thing that the Institute for Apprenticeships and Technical Education, in your view, could make a change uh, with how the apprenticeship model in England works when it comes to, for example, supporting ethnic minorities into apprenticeships to remain in apprenticeships and achieve well, what would that be? So there, there has been a, a number of support packages out there, and they have been uh, targeted towards uh, general uh, skills. And what we, what the, the uh, institute probably needs to look at now is what key priority sectors um, that are going to be uh, a priority for the next two, three, four, five years, where the skills gap will uh, increase significantly, and then focus them skills on the uh, with the, the minority communities because that's where uh, essentially we are in a position we can find and isolate, uh, isolate key skills that are needed and uh, upskill individuals from minority communities into okay. uh, particular uh, sectors. So I think that's probably where I would go. Uh, okay, I, I would put the focus on that, uh, okay. that place. Fantastic. But Tom, Tom, yeah. before we go, can I just have one last word? Yeah, go on, um, 20 I've seconds. I've got a whole, whole list of very <laughs> negative impacts uh, here, but uh, the PISA data, the Programme for International sure. Student Assessment, uh, outlines the fact that we have more resilient children in the UK than across the OECD on the average. That is, uh, children from disadvantaged backgrounds who succeed against the odds. So there will be children from those backgrounds who can bounce back and bounce back more quickly. Indeed. So there are some positives to hold on to. Absolutely. I agree. I agree. Yeah. I agree. And uh, as chair of the Care Leavers Trust uh, in Sussex, I know all about resilience and I've seen it yeah. in those young people. So Carol Willis, Chief Executive of the National Foundation for Educational Research, Issa Mutlib, who's the CEO of the BAME Apprenticeship Alliance. Thanks for taking time to talk to me on Skills World this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Call us today at Skills World Live. Dial 02032 900 treble 1. Took some time, but we pointed out that tomorrow isn't here right now, baby. An absent mind came to roam around. Captured you in a foggy cloud, baby Standing on my toes on the edge I'm ready to go See it clear when the shadows are lit I'm ready to go
That's ready to go. Celacy with Dinah Smith. I think that's actually the first time we've played that track on the show. So let us know what you think. Can email us at skillsworld at fenews.co.uk. Delighted now to continue the debate. And we've got two fine chaps to uh, focus on this discussion with us about the attainment and disadvantage gap. Russell Hobby, who's the Chief Executive Officer at Teach First, he joins us on the line, and Safraz Ahmed, who's the Careers Advisor at Leicester College. Good evening, chaps. Good evening. Hi, Tom. Evening. Hi there. Great to have you on the show. Now, Russell, your organisation has done a huge amount since it was established to get more people from all walks of life into teaching. To what extent, though, do you think that closing the attainment and disadvantage gap is, a, is about you know, the quality of the teachers? We know there are there are many forces at work in a young person's life that that help them to succeed or prevent them from su- succeeding at school. But I think the quality of teaching they receive is hugely uh, important uh, and the academic outcomes that that unlocks uh, then gives them the opportunities uh, in the rest of life as well. Uh, in turn, teachers need good quality leadership and they need the rest of society to help them out. Um, but I think, you know, if we had to put our money somewhere, um, I would put it on on the best quality teaching we possibly could. Absolutely. Now, um, so far as I really wanted to talk to you, actually, uh, particularly about you know, career ambitions, because you'll often hear policymakers say that, uh, and whether frankness is an excuse uh, or not, I don't know, but you'll hear them say that we can't tackle the disadvantage and attainment gap until students come from homes where there's more sort of career ambition. I mean, how true is that statement, do you think? Um, yeah, um, it's, it's, it's actually fairly true because I work in one of the largest FE colleges uh, in the UK, in the heart of Leicester. Yeah, Leicester's great, very great diverse. Uh, yeah. yeah, very, very diverse. Um, people coming from all walks of life. And the thing is, as well, you often find that people from ethnic minorities because they've come from different backgrounds and very diverse backgrounds you get two types of people one that are really ambitious for example they want to go right to the top they want to become doctors and go into law and really do well and others that lack the ambition because they lack the role models and that's where it becomes really difficult sometimes because you've got careers advisors and and teachers and people like that and then we sometimes have to build in that reality as well to say well look you've got this idea and this is where you want to go with it yeah Russell, uh, so far as they talked about um, role models, and I mean, you must come across this a lot in your work. You've uh, got you know, people from different backgrounds uh, who want to study and then teach different subjects. Some of them will actually not come f- straight from teacher college. That's the whole point of teach first. It brings people in from industry, for example. But do you recognise that point about the importance of role models, particularly perhaps for those learners who are from deprived backgrounds and are switched off learning don't quite get the whole what some might call you know the middle class game of deferred gratification and get good grades and get off to university and all the rest of it do you you know do you recruit teachers that are from shall we say you know quite quite challenged backgrounds initially but they've themselves managed to um you know to uh, get into teaching because they want to put something back in to the system yes i i, I do think role models are, are, are vital i think you need to pe- see people like you who've achieved great things and to, in order to believe that you can do it yourself and uh, at teach first i i kind of want both ends of the spectrum I'm, sure. I'm really keen for for very privileged people um to come in and, and spend some time in teaching and work with communities that are new to them but also i really want people from the schools that we serve to go on into into teaching and one of the, the proudest stats that that we have is that 30 percent of the people we recruited last year came from one of the schools that we serve which are those serving the most disadvantaged communities uh, in the country uh, and i think that that cycle and many of them were taught by a teach firster uh, themselves it that just pleases me um so much uh, uh, and although i i agree to an extent about the aspiration thing i i do think that people from all walks of life have have high hopes and, and aspirations. They have dreams about what they want their life to be, but they don't always see the, the journey between where they are now and where they would want to be. It's, it's the gap between the two. Uh, and how do you bridge that? And they often lack 
you know, those insights that those of us who who grew up perhaps with better connections or, or yeah. more privileged, you know, we just know how to get our first foot on the ladder. Sure, um, and, networks, yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Both, I really appreciate you coming on the show tonight. Uh, I mean, it's a fascinating uh, subject. And I mean, I really hope we can actually get you back on again and talk more about you know, the work that you're doing uh, in relation to education and teaching and careers advice. But alas, that's all we've got time yeah. for on Skills World this evening. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, bye. Thank you. That was Russell Hobby there of the Teach First organisation and Safraz Ahmed, who's a careers advisor at Leicester College. So that was episode 10, folks. Don't miss tomorrow's show, because I'll be debating the question, what should the UK skills sector priorities be? We'll be carrying an extended interview with Welsh Education Minister Kirsty Williams and my policy colleague, Rebecca Conway. She's going to be back on the show as well. Don't forget that if you want to be on the show, contact us, skillsworld at fenews.co.uk. You can also call us on the Skype phone, 02032 900 treble one. And as I say on this show, it seems well, every single night, the wonderful Skills World Live team will, I'm sure, get back to you. That leaves me just to say huge big thanks to the show's editor, Kelly O'Mara, and our digital producer, Ellie Hansen. Scales World Live is an FE news production supported by the Federation of Awarding Bodies Platinum Partners Programme. Join us tomorrow for episode 11. See ya. Subscribe to Skills World Live at fenews.co.uk forward slash skillsworld.